Well, t today in the, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm sorry for this. I, 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 things are going really slowly. I'll tell you, I am tired. I am tired and I'm feeling really beat up after several years of, of this teaching, pandemic teaching, and just going through the changes. And uh, winter quarter was especially hard. And um, it left me with no time for planning, but I need to really make my courses run the way that I like them to run. So I'm really, uh, this is a tough, this is a tough time. So I, I ask for you to, to bear with me. I have given everything that I can physically and mentally give for two years. And um, I'm, I'm running out of steam. And, uh, I'm trying as hard as I can. Um, now I have some health issues that I've got to deal with. And uh, that's got me a little bit uh, bothered as well. But um, anyway, um, trying to figure out what's, what's, what's wrong. I've got some breathing problems. And, uh, started last summer and uh, got a little bit worse in the fall. Really got, got especially bad in the winter. It's not, uh, it's not really an issue when I'm under normal conditions, but uh, I exercise a lot, and um, my ability to uh, exercise, the for the, you know, the hands-on, you know, the, the, the maintenance and, 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 and build side of engineering, you know, not just the, you know, the design calculation of the engineering side. Um, but uh, today, and for the next uh, couple of classes, we're going to be talking about the, the distribution side of, of HVAC. You know, we talked about how we generate the conditioned air, you know, the cool air, the warm air, you know, evaluating the heat transfer. So we've done the heat transfer, we've done the thermos part of HVAC. And now we look at what, what is really the fluid mechanics side of HVAC, is moving the stuff around. And mainly, you know, we're moving around air and, uh, and also water. Uh, as we get into larger systems, uh, industrial commercial scale systems. And we're, I think we're seeing more of a shift to water because when you're heating and cooling with, uh, with hot water or cold water, you, you eliminate fans, fan power, and ducts. Those are costly things that take, take up space um, and, uh, and they consume a lot of energy. Uh, and, and water is a much more effective heat transfer medium than, than air is. And uh, so we're starting to see more water-based, what we call radiant, uh, I'm sorry, hydronic-based systems. So instead of, like for heating, instead of having a, a fan blowing warm air uh, from the ceiling, you have uh, hot water running through tubes under the floor. And you have uh, radiant cooling coming up from the floor. It's, it's generally a more efficient way to uh, provide heating and uh, you can also do something similar with cooling. You put a, a cool, uh, have cool water flowing through pipes in a panel, like uh, I think we have that in this building, the uh, chill themes, where you bring cool water in and uh, you just create a cold space and you allow the cool to uh, uh, convect into the space, natural convection, or sometimes you might have a little fan um, and uh, it's quite cooling that way. But we still have, uh, have a lot of air. We move a lot of air in each back. So we're going to talk about moving air around and how to design a duct, you know, system of ducts and fans and things like that. Actually, in uh, the second half, at, at 9:45, the, we're going to have physical plant people come in and talk about our our, our air conditioning system here, and, uh, and 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 I also asked them to, to talk about some project ideas. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to get more project ideas out on the table today. And, Get an introduction to our own HVAC system here, and then uh, later we'll, uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to go over and actually take a look at our, our chillers and how the system here works. Um, but let me, uh, what, what I'm going to do here today is uh, 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 go over some of the, of the of the air side here. Now our text reading, you know, it's not not a lot of reading, but it, as you can see, if you look at the reading, um, first of all, there's an assumption that we basically we, we know how to design, we know how to read pump curves, and fan curves, and things like that, and how to do things. 
basic fan pump calculations uh, based on friction loss, doing friction analysis of a piping system. I don't know how much of that you remember from fluid mechanics. I don't know how much it was focused on. I can tell you when I teach it, that's a big focus of mine. But I know most faculty and the way most university fluid mechanics, it's very math. It's, it's theory oriented. And sometimes the, the practical application isn't as uh, emphasized as much. So I have a little review here. Um, who, did you all have, I don't even know who taught fluid mechanics last year. Was it Professor Abadi? Yeah, I know she's good. She, she, she'll cover. Uh, I think Professor someone Barat. from Boeing was. Huh? Yeah, it was Who's someone from Boeing. Huh? From Boeing. Oh, he's from Boeing. Oh, okay. So you probably got a practical, Yeah. I would think, from an industry person. Oh, okay. Boeing. Wow. I don't remember who that person was. Oh. Let's see. Yeah, it's Ivy. I think it's Huh? Lou Tai Lee. Tai Lee. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. Also, the the textbook does duct design a little bit different than, than I do. And um, so I'm going to attempt, I'm trying, my notes try to translate from the text to my own idiom. And I try as best I can to use the, to use the, the notation from the text, but some of it is, like when I uh, do calculations of pressure drop in fittings, elbows and things like that, I prefer the, uh, equivalent length method to use the equivalent length of fitting rather than calc rather than the coefficient, the loss coefficient. Uh, I, I just find loss loss coefficients are great if you're using software, uh, design software, but if you're doing manual calculations, it's just you get pain. Um, <coughs> this, this is this not working? I have to calm down. I tend to get frantic. The doctor said, you've got, you got to calm down. We're going to have to give you a sedative or something. You can't be a little bit less frantic and excitable. By the way, I, I just put my notes up in, in Canvas for today so you can find them if you want to uh, follow along. something? No, it's off. It, it's, it's off? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I threw a fit in my heat transfer class uh, last time because the, this thing's broken. It, it just sits, you can't move it. So I can't, I can't use the whiteboard. And I'm like, yeah, I, I you know, I was, I was having to write off the corners and um, it seems like uh, plagued by technical issues. We have a homework assignment that's due next week. Um, 
I haven't posted it yet, but I'll try to get it posted today. Let's see what that gets do. Would that be an air distribution? Yes. Yeah, maybe some water. Yeah, it's it's due on Tuesday. I'm I'm, I'm going to make that. We'll we'll ship that to Wednesday, uh, Monday from Monday to Wednesday. Um, today's Wednesday, so a week from today it'll be it'll be due. Yes. I did want to ask, uh, what unit would we be allowed to start using the duct Oh, yeah, actually now. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, man, I should have reminded you all to bring your duct elator to class today. Um, I was going to do some exercises with it, but then I, I wasn't sure how many people would have it. Um, so I will uh, do a, an example or two um, here using the duct elator. And, uh, and then for the, for the homework, you'll have uh, now anything that you can do with the duct elator, you can do using uh, a, a, another method. You can use the method in the textbook, which has this table or a graph where you, if you know the diameter of the duct, or the, you have to know the duct size, the velocity, and the CFM. So you need those three things, diameter, CFM, velocity, and you can figure out the pressure, the friction loss, the pressure loss in the duct. Um, and uh, so you can do that graphically. You can even calculate it using friction factor equation, Dar Darcy Weisbach equation like in fluid mechanics. Nobody does that in HVAC. But um, you can, and uh, but it's just convenient that the, the ductulator makes it just really easy to do. Cool. Yes. So in that case, in order for them to make this, I'm assuming they decided an equivalent roughness then for yes, the, for the they ducts. Does that make assume, sense? Yeah. A, they assume that it's a sheet metal. Okay. It's sheet metal duct, and you know which has a friction, uh, which has a roughness. Relative roughness of 0 0.0003 feet, I think, and it's based on uh, standard conditions for atmosphere pressure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, and and we can we can adjust. Um, for, for the most part, we we can just use the atmospheric conditions because we're mainly we're mainly using. Our, our duct ductwork design uh, is focused on sizing the fan, choosing a fan to move the air, and generally using 68 degree air is sufficient in designing the uh, ductwork system. There may be some exceptions when you get to really low temperature air or really, really hot air. Um, but for now, we're just going to assume that we're at 68 degrees and that makes our duct later uh, really convenient. Um, no, no. Are right, you seeing it? Green light. Oh, okay. So maybe it looks like it might be coming on. Okay, great. It's been long enough. Uh, it's like, I think maybe it's like me. It's just getting old and broken, <laughs> broken down. <laughs> Excess use, right? Um, it needs to be taken in for maintenance. <coughs> All right, so you know we've conditioned the air. Now we've got to move it to where uh, to, to the occupied spaces. So I have to organize this into you know basic review of of the relevant fluid mechanics, and then applications to uh, sizing ducts and sizing the fan. And then next week we'll do the same thing for the water side, where we look at pumps and pipes, pumps, pipes, and water. Next week, air, ducts, and fans. Right now. Um, and of course, we, you know, we start with the Bernoulli equation, uh, central to fluid mechanics, thermodynamics. Total energy is uh, energy that's, the, the, think of energy as, as being within the pressure. Of course, this is reflected in the enthalpy of thermodynamics. Uh, so pressure, energy, velocity, you know, which of course refers to motion, uh, to translation of the fluid, and it's gravitational potential energy. So the sum of those three terms represents the total energy of a fluid at any, you know, at any point in a flow system, EP, EV, EZ. Um, in HVAC, we generally don't use energy to describe 
we have the energy, but we use pressure or uh, head, really, total head. Um, head is uh, in units of length, and it actually refers to the height of a column of water that would support the fluid with that given energy. And head, we can obtain head from energy by just dividing energy by g, by gravity. And that would give us a number that's in units of meters or feet. And then if we multiply head by specific weight, rho times g, uh, we get total pressure. So there's three common ways that we represent, or three unit systems we can use for the Bernoulli equation, energy, head, and pressure. And we can convert back and forth uh, using these little, little formula here. But for the most part, we use uh, head when we design our, uh, our piping and our ducting system. Sometimes PSI, uh, when we're, 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 we're really more often head is, is, uh, the, is the, uh, the, the way we represent energy and it's used in pump curves, manufacturers, pump curves, stand curves, and things like that. Um, and you know, as you know, when fluid flows through a, a pipe, we have uh, losses due to friction. And friction loss can be very serious in air systems. Um, and you know, especially if you have lots of bends, and elbows, and things like that in our, in our HVAC system. And as you remember, we can use the Darcy Weisbach equation to calculate that head loss. Um, it's proportional to the friction factor, which we can find using you know, the Moody chart, and we can calculate it. And that's a function of the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number and the roughness of the duct or pipe. Now we don't really often, we don't use that very often. We can, but uh, we have the ductulator, we have uh, graphs and uh, software that will do these calculations for us now. Um, I, if I'm gonna use, uh, if I'm gonna uh, calculate friction head loss, my preferred means is to use the Colebrook uh, equation because I don't have to, um, I don't have to use the Moody chart with that. I don't even think I included it here. But, uh, oh yeah, here it is. Uh, not, not the Colebrook, the, the swami Jane equation is, is a, an approximation. It's, it's an approximate way of calculating friction factor uh, where we can actually calculate Calculated. The problem is uh, if we use the Colebrook or some of these other methods, um, it turns out that F is on both sides of the equal sign. That makes it hard to solve. You have to do it iteratively. And that's why the Moody chart is useful. But the Swami Jane equation just has F on one side, and if we know the, the, roughness, the relative roughness and the Reynolds number, we can get an estimate for it. So that's, that's what I use when I have to. But most, for the most part, yeah, we use tables or other methods. Um, and uh, the Reynolds number, you remember, uh, hydraulic diameter times velocity over the kinematic viscosity. So uh, you increase velocity, you increase Reynolds number. Uh, you, you, for lower viscosity, you increase Reynolds number. Um, viscosity of air and water, you know, fairly low. Hydraulic diameter, four times the, the area, the cross-sectional area, over the perimeter. This is a perimeter we call wetted perimeter. So it's the perimeter of the, the duct or the pipe that is touching the fluid. Now if you have a gas like air, air fills the duct. So um, this is just the cross-sectional, uh, I'm sorry, this is just the perimeter of the duct. But if you have a fluid, going through the duct, um, and the duct isn't full of fluid, then this number will actually be less than the total perimeter. We might have to worry about that. We mainly worry about that with open channel flow. You know, you have a, uh, a duct, like an open-ended duct with water white might flow through it or something like that. Um, for a round pipe, which is what we're gonna deal with, is water, full, full of water, the, 
hydraulic diameter is just D for a rectangular duct, two times the width times the height of the W plus H, but we really don't, we don't have to worry about that. Um, what we do have to worry about is in HVAC, we usually can choose between round duct and rectangular duct, and sometimes elliptical duct. The elliptical duct is nice because it's flat, and it, goes, it doesn't take a lot of space, vertical space. And uh, people like it because it's, it fits into a lot of tight spaces. It's just expensive, so it's not often used. Now, if you can get away with it, round duct is always the best way to go. It's gonna give you the least friction loss, you know, the smallest fan, the least power requirement to move fluid around, and uh, probably we'd all use round ducts if we could. The problem is round ducts take up space. Um, it's hard to fit them into a lot of locations, and for that reason, rectangular ducts tend to be the most common. I mean, you do see round ducts, especially in the large main line, the main headers, but when you get into the guts of the building and in the ceilings and in different cap and wall cavities, you often just don't have the space for a full diameter all the way around. So you get something that's flat and, and wide, and there's a way to calculate the equivalent size of a round duct for a given rectangular duct, dimensions of rectangular duct. And uh, it, it's hard to go the other way because uh, with, with a rectangular duct, you have two variables, height and width. Typically, the designer will choose one, uh, one dimension, uh, typically the height, because that, the, the height <coughs> is the one that is usually the, the most constrained by, by space. So, you, so how much height do I have? And then I'll play with the width. Uh, I'll find the width that will give me an acceptable pressure loss through the system. Um, often, you know, by convention, we design for round duct, and then we convert to rectangular duct at the end, the equivalent rectangular duct. And the ductilator makes that easy to do. It has um, a window that has the round duct diameter that goes along with the particular flow, and then it shows you how to, uh, an equivalent rectangular duct with varying height and width that are, is equivalent to that round duct. Um, then there's also graphs that we can leave us to do that. Um, typically, our roughness, 0 0.0003 for sheet metal duct, by far the most common, commonly used duct. Sometimes we use aluminum or some other materials. Um, but uh, sheet metal, by far the most, most common. And um, friction factor for laminar flow, we don't really see laminar flow uh, in, in HVAC systems very, very often. Um, and if we need to calculate F, but we usually don't have to do that. We do have to um, calculate pressure drop through our pipes and through the fittings you know, that connect different pieces of the, of the system. Um, and uh, typically what we do is we find out how long of a duct do I need. So you, first you figure out the size of the duct, then how long is it gonna be to get, you know, go from the fan to the various points of distribution. And based on that length, let's say you have 100 feet of duct, then you use your ductilator to find out the pressure drop per 100 feet of the pipeline. And typically, the tables in the ductilator give us head loss per 100 feet of pipe, and we just multiply that by however long the duct is, and that gives us the, the head loss in inches of water, inches of water through that duct. So that's pretty easy. You just figure out how long my run has to be. Now, generally, there's two types of, of ductwork systems. Uh, one, one is uh, you have a fan you have, that, that discharges into a big header, and this header will just go you know, the length of the building or the length of the space, and then you'll tap off of it to various zones, 
or spaces in the building where you need air. And uh, so that's one type of a, of a design um, that you might see when the HVAC system is in the same building as the points of distribution. But in a place like a college campus where you have multiple buildings with, served by a central chiller system or heating system, um, the, the, uh, the system is radial where you might come out like, uh, like some big header here and then you have um, feed out to the different buildings. You know, something, something like that. So that's a radial system that is common where you have a central chiller or heat, heating system somewhere and you're sending it out in all different directions. Um, so those are the two general types of systems that you see. Um, so uh, We have our main losses due to the, the lengths of, of the duct. And then we have to add in what are called the minor losses. These are the losses from fittings, uh, valves. You know, if it's a fluid-based, water-based system, you have valving and uh, elbows and things like that. Uh, dampers are common in air distribution systems and dampers have a loss and there's all kinds of fittings. And there's, there are T's and elbows and Y's. There are diverging sections and converging sections. Um, there's just all kinds of different, I think more than 200 varieties of, uh, of fittings. And, um, ASHRAE maintains a database with all these conventional fittings. And you can go into the database and look up the <coughs> loss of uh, for each one. And, uh, and then use that to calculate the loss for that fitting. Alternatively, you can look up an equivalent length of that, of that fitting. What, what that loss, the, 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 the length of a straight duct that would give you the same friction loss as that single fitting. That's what I typically use because I find it easier to deal with in my calculations. So our, our, uh, our energy loss is the sum of the minor losses and the major losses from the straight lengths of the pipe. We can convert that to delta P if need be. Um, pressure losses generally are reported as inches of water per 100 feet <coughs> of duct. And uh, once we sum the total losses, we can then size the fan. We choose a fan that provides a sufficient pressure to equal to overcome the losses in the system. And then a little bit of an increment to give us velocity. The fan is going to give us pressure and it's going to give us velocity. So the sum total of what that fan delivers, the sum energy is its velocity energy and its pressure energy. And that's what we use to size the fan. Uh, HA is uh, the conventional term for fan head or pump head, and, uh, and we can use that to figure out uh, uh, the, the horsepower, the power requirement, and that's going to be based on the flow rate. So that to size the pump or the fan, you need the, the head that the fan has to build to overcome losses, and you need the flow rate. How much of the fluid are you pushing through? And together, those are going to give us uh, power, horsepower, and, uh, and, and that enables us to size the fan and the, the motor that powers it. Um, the, uh, a fan, the output of the fan, the mechanical output of the fan, we call that uh, air horsepower. Air horsepower. That's the energy going into the air. We're moving around. Okay? Then the input to the fan. Uh, is brake horsepower. This is the power on the shaft coming from the motor. And then the motor is taking an input of electric power. Most motors are electrically driven. So the brake horsepower is going to be the electric power input uh, reduced by the 
motor efficiency. And then the air horsepower is going to be the brake horsepower times the efficiency of the, of the fan, the mechanical efficiency of the fan. So here's water horsepower for pumps, air horsepower for fans, and uh, so we can figure out what our input energy requirement uh, is, is, is going to be. Um, so the extended Bernoulli equation can be developed once we calculate the friction loss, the losses that have to be overcome. And then the pumping energy, or the fan energy, that goes to overcome that. So we have the total uh, energy going in, the sum of the pressure, velocity, gravitational potential energy, plus energy from the pump or the fan. So that's on the left side, and that has to equal the downstream total energy, plus the losses due to friction. <coughs> from the ducts themselves, the, the length of straight runs plus the minor losses. And y'all did this in fluid mechanics? The, the developing, writing out the Bernoulli equation in this way? Okay, good. For water at 68 degrees, we can calculate the required water horsepower once we know the pump head is required and we have a flow rate in gallons per minute. This is the water horsepower when head is in feet and Q is in GPM. This is at 68 degrees. This number here is just a conversion factor. It gives us a, a, a unit here in, uh, in horsepower. And then for air, the, uh, the total pressure in inches of water times the CFM and divided by 6356, this would be for uh, 68 degree air, and that would be our air, air horsepower, okay? So we get into ducts, we have the trunk system, the system, the radial system, and um, we'll talk about the ductulator here and how we would use that. It's like a slide rule where we can input the dimensions of the duct, the uh, velocity of the, of the air, the CFM, and we can see what our, our loss is going to be, our friction loss, pressure loss due to friction. And um, then for fittings, the textbook gives us uh, loss coefficients for a variety of fittings. I prefer to use equivalent lengths, and I have, so I have an equivalent length table at the end of these notes. So we can look up equivalent lengths. Um, and uh, what I do is I assume, when I do my duct design, I design for a pressure loss of 0.1 inches of water per 100 feet of duct. And I can go into my fitting table and look under uh, for 0.1 inches of, of head loss per 100 feet of duct. I can see what the equivalent length of that fitting would be. And then I just add that on to the length of straight line of duct. So here's an example here. We got a 40 foot run of 19 inch diameter round duct with an elbow. And actually, I give uh, some equivalent lengths here so we don't have to look these up. So the elbow has an equivalent length of 10D, 10 times the diameter uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the fitting. And then a branching T that has a loss coefficient of 1.2. Velocity is 1,000 FPM. What's the total frictional pressure loss? So we sum the contributions from the straight duct, the elbow, and the T. So losses from the T, from the elbow, from the straight duct. And we have a 19 inch diameter round duct. So I go here to my ductilator. I don't know, do you have your ductilator handy? If you do have it, um, if you are in the, in the little white slot, make sure you're on the IP side. If you line up that big arrow to 19, so that would be 19 inches. D equals 19. And now look at the red. 
and being careful not to not to jostle, not to move it once you've lined, lined up that arrow. Look at the red side, um, which is, see it says round duct velocity. So it says velocity is 1,000 feet per minute. So 1,000 feet per minute. What's our CFM? 2,000 CFM. Yeah, you should see that the, um, the 1,000 FPM lines up with 2,000 CFM. So this is telling me that if I have a 19-inch round duct and I'm running air at 1,000 feet per minute, the volume flow rate will be 2,000 CFM. So now I go to the blue, the blue zone, or see it says friction head loss, and I look on the outer rim of that for 2,000 CFM, and I see what the friction head loss is, and it looks like it's what, point? 0.08. About 0 0.08. Point, so 0 0.008 inches of water gauge per 100 feet. You know, when I was teaching online, um, I had my on my little camera, so I could just put this uh, and display it to the students. They could watch me work it. And um, I, I just, I'm not set up to do that here. Um, but uh, I, I hope, you know, if you don't have your doctor later with you, you can, you can go home and pl play around with it and see how this works. It's really pretty cool. Um, so once you have that, that friction loss, now you can calculate the various uh, pressure the pressure calculations. Now, the velocity, we call velocity head, is the energy from velocity. Uh, this is, um, the velocity head is, is calculated out as is, is density times V squared over two. So it's related to kinetic energy and the density of the fluid. Okay. Now, when we assume we have air, and the density is the density of air at 68 degrees, 0.075 uh, pounds per cubic feet, then uh, we, we can just reduce this to a little convenient formula here, uh, velocity pressure, V over 4,005 squared. And when I calculate this, it's going to give me a result in inches of water gauge. So the unit conversion is built in. So 1,000 feet per minute is my velocity. Uh, that's going to give me 0.062 inches of water gauge. That's the pressure equivalent of fluid moving at that, of air, of air moving at that, uh, that velocity. So that's, my, that, that, that's the energy that's going to move the air, give me velocity. Then there's the loss that we, we got from our ductilator. The friction loss, 0.08 per 100 feet. Now I have 40 feet of duct. Here. 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 Does it not say the, uh, oh yeah, 40 foot run. So I got 40 feet of straight duct. And then I look at my elbow here. Um, a 19 inch diameter. So 19 divided by 12 converts that to feet. So that the loss from my, my elbow is 10 feet. So it's 10 times the diameter. So there's my loss from my elbow. And then I have my loss from the T, which is, has a loss coefficient of 1.2. And um, 0.062, we multiply that by the velocity pressure here. This, that's because the, the, the loss, so the, the head loss, uh, minor head loss, is equal to the loss coefficient times um, rho v squared over 2, right? That's the minor loss coefficient. The minor loss when we have the loss coefficient c. Um, and that's what this, uh, what this calculation is here. Uh, so we sum that up, and this gives us a total pressure loss of 0.119 inches of water gauge. So my fan has to build this to counter, to, to overcome the losses from 
the straight run of duct, the elbow, and the teeth. Okay, there's my loss. Now we just do this, you know, a, a real design is gonna be, you know, 100 times bigger than this, maybe. So there's a lot of accounting for all your runs of duct and all the fittings in that system. Okay, so when we're designing a system, we've got compromises we have to make between duct size, small ducts, cheaper, and they fit nicely into the space. That also means the velocities are going to be higher. Higher velocity means higher friction loss. It means bigger fans to overcome that loss. And loss, if you remember, loss varies with the square of the velocity. So you double velocity, you increase your pressure loss by fourfold. And that's a big cost in terms of the, the size of the fan you're going to need to overcome those losses. Um, Low velocity just means you're going to have to have bigger ducts. So you're going to have to have the space to put those ducts in, bigger fittings, bigger ducts are more expensive. You know, so you're going to pay one way or the other. You, you have to do a, a you have to, to balance the costs here. And the software now will optimize that. It will find a design that uh, gives you, an, uh, 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 that optimizes on the costs and also for the energy consuming energy. Um, so however we, whatever methods we use in our design, some rules here, total pressure always decreases in the direction of the flow. Um, in, in systems with two or more branches, the losses between the fan and the end of each branch is the same. So generally the rule of thumb here is we, we, if we have a branched system, we choose the branch that has the highest loss. And that's usually the longest run from the fan to the point of distribution. And then that becomes the, the, uh, uh, the, the we call it the critical run in our system. And we design our fan, we size our fan to drive air through that critical run. It's usually the longest, not always the longest, because there might be a lot of fittings in a shorter run or, 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 or more CFM or something like that, but it's generally the longest run and we, we look at the pressure loss in that run and we size our fan uh, uh, accordingly. Static pressure and velocity pr pressure are convertible. Each can increase or decrease in the direction of flow. And you know this from the continuity equation, if you can increase velocity by making the, the, the duct smaller, so you can reduce velocity, and, but that increases pressure, or you make the duct bigger, that's gonna increase pressure and reduce velocity. So you can trade off between velocity and pressure. But the total sum of those will fall as you move down the line from the fan uh, to the end for the distribution. Um, so how we size the ducts, there are several methods that you can use. The most common by far is the equal friction method. And that sizes ducts so to maintain a constant pressure loss per unit length of duct through the system. And I think I mentioned I, I generally use 0.1 inches per 100 feet of duct. And I size everything so that I know in any one, you know, any uh, 100 foot length of duct in my system, I'm going to drop 0.1 inches of water in pressure. So fix the velocity in the main supply duct. I need to decide what that's going to be. And there are, there are design rules, there are ASHRAE standards on, on velocity. Typically, it's between one and 3,000 feet per minute, but it depends on the application, and it depends on the location of the duct. Is the duct in the ceiling? Is it, is it, are there acoustical tiles that protect or that separate the duct from where the people are? The problem is moving air makes noise. The noise can be a serious problem. The higher the velocity, the greater the noise. And we have to be mindful of that in our design. And so we have to think about what is our space being used for and where is my duct located? Do I have to worry about noise? And there are noise standards. And if we had time, 
in a, in a really longer, much longer course, we look at the acoustical side of, of HVAC because there's considerable noise involved with pumps and fans and moving fluids. You put those in a, in a, in a constrained space, you've got noise. And you have to manage that. And there are standards for that. But this is some general rules of thumb. The textbook has some tables. I like these here because it's simple. Like I say, okay, I'm designing up an apartment. Um, my main header, 1,500 feet per minute. I choose that. That's the velocity coming off my fan. And then everything else adjusts to that velocity. Okay? So we start by looking at the fan outlet. What's the velocity coming off that fan going to be? And uh, that's actually step one here, I was step by step explanation of the method. Select the velocity for the main supply duct, then determine the duct size and friction loss for the main supply duct. Then the friction in each successive section is set equal to this pressure loss. Uh, we're, we're doing a presentation with you. Excuse me? We're, we're doing a presentation with you. Would oh, you yeah, yeah, to? sure. Yeah. Would you want us to come in? Oh, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I've got a few more minutes to go here. But, okay. Yeah. Well, okay, just wait. We'll okay. There. And uh, so each each time you pass a branch, you're going you're gonna to drop off some of your flow, right? So you're going to, you know, you might have uh, uh, 8,000 CFM coming off the fan. And this location may need 2,000 CFM. That location may need 1,000 CFM. That means here you're going to have 8,000 minus 3. You're going to have 5,000 CFM. And then you come here, and maybe they need 1,000, and they need 1,000. And then you're going to come out with 3,000 CFM. And you're going to keep going, dropping off CFM to all the places. Remember, we did the design to figure out, OK, how much CFM of supply air do you need? that's what we're providing is supply air until we get to the end and then there's nothing left. I mean, this, this person gets the last bit of the CFM that was, uh, that was pushed out there. But every time you reduce the CFM, you reduce the size of the duct. So typically you end up with a system that uh, gets you know, smaller, kind of like that, until you get down to the end. Yes? I did want to ask about that. Do they sell a tapered section, or is it just tapered because of those? Like it's not it, it's not sold tapered, correct? You'd have to buy. The, You'd have to buy fittings. Okay. Yeah. So there's a. So every every however many feet there would be a, a kind of almost like a like national pipe thread fitting of some sort, correct? Or it would neck down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, thank and you. there's a rule there. You should not neck down more than 15 degrees. So this angle here should be less than 15 degrees. Otherwise, you create pressure drop. You create turbulence and you lose energy that way. So there are these rules of thumb you want to follow to make sure you don't introduce you know, unnecessary pressure losses into the system, because that means bigger fans, more electric power, and so on. And uh, uh, yeah, so after each branch, you reduce the supply flow rate uh, by the flow rate in the branch, from the, based on the flow rate in the branches, then you calculate the new velocity and duct size that give you the same friction loss as you had in that main supply duct. Okay? Then you identify the run of duct that has the greatest friction loss. That's your critical run. That fan, the fan must provide pressure equal to that pressure drop in addition to the required static pressure at the outlet. So you have to leave some energy at the end of the duct to come through the, the grill. You have to push through the grill and into the room. Uh, so in a, in a complete design, you actually have to, you have to, you have to choose the grill, you know, the outlet. You have to size that outlet, select it, and look at the pressure loss through that outlet and make sure you, you come out of the end of the duct with enough oomph Get in. You don't want nice cold air coming and then it stops, right? <laughs> it, can't, can't, it can't get into the room. The people, what's going on in there? Put, you put your hand up there and you feel it nice and cool, but none of it's coming out because the engineer forgot to factor in the pressure loss through the, through the grill. It's easy to forget. Um, and then it has to have velocity too, so it comes out 
It's supposed to come out and move to about the center of the room and then start to drop off. And then it mixes with the room air and you get that, that cooling and dehumidification. Um, yeah, so uh, use dampers to equalize pressure in all the branches. And then there's an example here where I show you exactly how to, how to apply that, that multi-step approach. Uh, here's a system, we, we need 1,200 CFM in this zone and 2,000 CFM in this zone and 800 CFM here. And we've got one, two, three elbows. Um, and we have uh, some specified pressure we need to get through the grill here. Um, uh, so we need 0.15 inches of water at the end so we can move through the grill. So we want to size up this system. And I show you how to use the ductilator to, uh, to do that. And uh, so see, you can just go through, take your ductilator and just work through. And uh, each time you pass one of those branches, you reduce the flow rate. And you just move on until you get to the very end. Identify the run with the greatest friction loss, as it turns out, ABC. That's kind of obvious from looking at the, at the diagram here. So this is a critical run. So we've got to make sure that we've got enough energy in the fan to get to here. And then we use dampers. We put dampers in these ducts to give us uh, the, the, to make sure that the system is balanced. Okay. So here uh, is calculating equivalent lengths of elbows, so we're factoring our fittings, and uh, it's summing up the losses, losses in the T, loss in the T, and then we just sum everything up, losses in the straight run, losses in the T, losses, not, not the loss, but the energy we need at the, at the end to get into the, through the grill, and we have 0.665 inches of water. And then our velocity head is 0 0.160. We sum those, and that is the total uh, head that our fan has to deliver. Okay? And this is in round duct for a round duct. And then the example three takes that result from the round duct and turns it into a rectangular duct that is. Uh, 20 inches on one side, and no greater than 17 inches. So our, we, we've got a space constraint of 17 inches in one direction. So we have to figure out how we can flatten this round duct to give us, you know, to fit into the space, but still have the same pressure losses, the same mechanical properties as this as this round duct here. And it just shows how to how to do that. And that's the green zone on the, uh, the ductilator. This shows you, once you have a round diameter, that allows you to determine a, a rectangular size equivalent to that round diameter. Now you can have a, a rectangle that's really long on one side, right, really short on the other, bad design. Big pressure losses. Generally, you want the duct to be as square as possible. And you want the aspect ratio, the, the ratio of the longest size to the shortest size would be no greater than eight to one. Ideally, no greater than four to one. Square can get away with it, but usually you can't. Um, so there you go. And uh, I'll let you all read about fans and we'll, we'll, we'll do the fan stuff. This is fun. De uh, developing fan curves, building fan curves given uh, if you get one curve from the manufacturer, how do you build or create a curve that's specific to your application? It shows you how to do that here. The textbook does this too, but it kind of uh, doesn't give you a lot of detail about how to do it. Um, so I'll stop here because I think we've got some guests that want to come in and tell us about our campus stuff. Quick question or? Yes, sir. Um, Inner circle is it like dimension and then the outer like what's a different dimension? So. Yeah, one one dimension is the inner and the other is the outer. And uh, I will uh, 
uh, I'll try to do a little video, just an example of working this. Well, I'll point my, uh, um, I'll point my little image device and just just show you how to do this. It's it's pretty. I think once you see it once, you can probably figure it out yourself. But you just see it use one time. Okay. All right. We're gonna stretch a bit. I'm gonna invite our guests to come in and. Uh,